Okay, I'll start that one more time. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy that you're here. And I got to tell you of many of the webinars that we've done, um, I have been most looking forward to this one and excited is reading the book, um, Save Your Ammo, Working Across Cultures for National Security was like a walk down memory lane for me. And having spent uh, the last 15, 20 years of my career working in security cooperation and dealing with uh, partners in the CENTCOM AOR, it was uh, just uh, really refreshing to see um, somebody take, take the time and go out and interview people that have been working in this environment and writing down their stories and then taking their stories and putting together into some really succinct ways to teach the next generation. So with that, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Restman. All right. Um, let me make sure I'm not muted here. Okay, I'm not. Um, Thank you very much, Doug and John and Third Order Effects uh, for giving me this opportunity today and for hosting. I really appreciate it. Uh, first, want to say I love the name of your group. It's right, as you know already, it's right in line with the topic um, that I'll be talking about today. Um, so as Doug just mentioned, I'm here to tell you a bit about um, my recent book with my co-author, Dr. Winston Seek. A uh, book is called Save Your Ammo, Working Across Cultures for National Security. And this book is really, it's all about um, thinking strategies that allow people to see through human cultural complexity and past what might seem like immediate options for engaging when they work in foreign environments. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited and I've been looking forward to this discussion. So first of all, let me just tell me, tell you a little bit about myself and my background, and then I'll talk to you more about uh, the book about Save Your Ammo, the studies that it's based on, and kind of how it's organized. Um, I'll take about 15 minutes for that, and then I'll be ready to answer any questions that you might have. So um, my background is in cognitive psychology. Um, I'm the co-founder of, uh, of a company called Global Cognition, and we are a research and development firm um, that uses cognitive science theory and methods to inform training and education problems. Uh, we're a small group of cognitive psychologists and what we do um, is we study thinking, decision making and expertise um, in applied work contexts. And some of our colleagues who work in this uh, similar area who study expertise, uh, they might focus on areas like uh, weather forecasting, chess playing, piloting airplanes or firefighting are some of the areas other folks study. Um, for more than a decade, um, we have been focusing our attention on studying expertise uh, when it comes to working across cultures. And really, I want to say this has been such an, such an interesting uh, last several years looking at this is issue and really a passion for me as well because um, my bone background is I'm bicultural myself. Um, I grew up in Denmark originally, and so I've seen firsthand um, what it's like to live and work in a, in a new foreign culture. Um, so in studying expertise in working across cultures, we've used a variety of methods uh, to, to do that. And one of them um, that's relevant to the book today is a method called cognitive task analysis or CTA interviewing. And CTA interviewing is a method for interviewing experts in various areas to extract their thinking strategies and their habits of mind, if you will, um, that help them solve tough problems or challenges in the context of their job so that they can be extracted and taught to others. And so over the years, um, we have had the pleasure and the opportunity to interview hundreds of military and foreign service professionals um, from across uh, all walks of Department of Defense um, about the tough challenges that they experience when they work with people from other cultures. And um, so we've had an opportunity to talk to a very wide variety of, of folks, as I mentioned, in different roles and jobs. And some of those include uh, people who work in jobs that have culture in the job description, so to speak. So 
um, diplomats, foreign area officers, civil affairs uh, personnel, a uh, variety of special forces from all the branches and um, intelligence personnel as well. Um, but we really we also had the opportunity to sit down with uh, folks who work in jobs and in areas that don't necessarily have uh, culture or ling language expertise of any kind in, in their job uh, description or training. So uh, combat pilots, uh, small unit leaders, planners, convoy commanders, medics, mechanics, engineers of all kinds, and uh, submarine nuclear uh, captain even, that I'll come up again um, in a little bit. And it's, it's been really fascinating and we're really excited to be able to share some of this, uh, uh, what we've learned from all this through the years um, in our book. Um, so in these interviews, when we sat down to folks and they talked to us about their experiences, they really have been talking to us about situations where they came across culture in the sense that um, in the deeper levels of culture that we sometimes talk about. So situations where there were differences in expectations, differences in understanding or perceptions of the best ways to do things, challenges communicating, or sometimes just figuring out what the heck is going on um, with this person or in the situation that you're, you're working in right now. And by analyzing all these uh, stories, um, what we've done is we've identified 12 core competencies, as we call them, core sets or clusters of skills that seem to be important uh, for folks to meet the challenges that they described in our interviews. And so these general competencies um, are ones uh, that seem to be important no matter what the region folks were working in. Um, or what the task was or their mission. And just at a high level, these competencies have to do with uh, being able to maintain a productive mindset when you're working in a foreign environment, um, how to be, be reflective about your own reactions and the things that are going on around you. Um, we also, there's a set sets of skills that are associated with uh, self-directed learning as we call it. So being able to learn on your own about the culture, um, and uh, being able to figure out what's good information and what's not so good information about this area or this culture I'm working in. Um, how, and lastly, to manage your skills associated with managing your communication and thinking uh, and planning carefully about uh, what you're gonna say and how you're gonna say it to uh, project the messages that you intend. These are all sets of skills um, and competencies that we think uh, really allow people to come up with clever ways for accompanying, uh, accomplishing their objectives um, so that they can save their ammo for, for when they need it. Um, and that's um, right in the title. Um, so a big portion of the studies that we've done through the years in this area have been in support of the Defense Language National Security Education Office, or DELENCIO. Um, to help them develop policy. And the 12 competencies I just mentioned um, describe baseline competencies, cultural competencies uh, that we've identified that have informed uh, the Department of Defense instruction uh, that guides the management of LREC uh, programs uh, across the Department of Defense. So back to the stories. Um, so the stories that we've heard over the years um, have been great for defining, supporting research like this and for uh, defining expertise in this area, but we also think they're really great for demonstrating the real applied value of these skills and these strategies um, in a real practical, real world way. And um, like I mentioned before, they're also really good uh, for teaching others, so for teaching folks who are new to coming into working in foreign contexts, and that's kind of been our goal. Uh, with Save Your Ammo to put some of these stories into a format where they uh, were engaging and where they could help others learn and grow their capabilities. <clears throat> so the result, um, we think, um, is a book that um, is intended to read more like a novel than a textbook. Um, and so each chapter of the book is dedicated to one of the 12 competencies that I mentioned. Um, and this, but the stories and the application really comes first. So 
all the skills and strategies that we uh, offer up in the book uh, from our research um, are illustrated through real work examples. So let me give you an example of that. Um, and um, so one competency that we have found to be really quite central uh, to working with people in other parts of the world really um, who have grown up in entirely different contexts uh, growing up with different sets of values and beliefs and experiences um, is perspective taking. So that really is all about being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes um, to figure out what they want, why they want that, and what they might expect from you. Um, so perspective taking is key. And this is one competency that we found when we, uh, when we speak to people is one that seems to intuitively make a lot of sense. Uh, to people um, that this is something that is uh, is good to do um, but it we've also found that it often has more to it than what first comes to mind for a lot of people so taking someone else's perspective is really it's more than trying to understand how they feel which is um, I think is our intuitive sense of what perspective taking is so empathizing with other people um, what we've seen is it's really also um, often about understanding someone else's experiences um, and how they view the immediate situation or problem um, that, that you're working on right now so that you can figure out the best ways to communicate with, with them. And we have a, a number of different examples of different types of perspective taking in the book. And uh, let me just uh, give you one brief one so you can get a sense. Um, so this experience um, is one that was told to us by a sergeant who was working with a small team in Afghanistan. And the team had recently been attacked while they were out on patrol and they'd lost six members of the team. Um, so they were all highly motivated to find the people who were responsible for this attack quickly. Um, and so, the problem they were running into was the two Afghan informants that they had found um, seemed like they were lost themselves in the environment. So when the sergeant and his team members uh, put maps in front of them, uh, they were shaking their heads and it seemed like they, they couldn't make sense of that map. So in that kind of situation, it might be easy for the first thoughts uh, that come through your mind in that kind of situation to be, oh, well, they're they're not competent, at least at reading maps, because uh, they can't make sense of them, or that they're shady, that they're, um, they're trying to hide the information, and that's why they're pretending to be lost. Um, the sergeant in this case kind of stepped back from the situation and thought about the Afghans' experiences, and he realized that these guys had probably never been up in the air. They'd never seen their village from a bird's eye view. And so that meant they had no basis for making sense of, of a map. And so thinking about what the Afghans uh, were used to seeing, what they were thinking in the situation gave them an idea. Um, what he did was he uh, strapped a camera to a helmet and he put a guy on a motorcycle and sent him around the area, driving all over. And then he showed that footage to the Afghans and uh, the Afghans looked at that and they said, oh, what? Uh, drive 30 minutes down this street and then take a left and then a right and then you'll be there. Um, so this was a really clever way to solve this problem that was all grounded in him putting himself in the Afghan shoes. Um, and it shows that perspective taking is uh, sometimes it's about understanding people's feelings and their preferences, but other times it's really also about appreciating what other people know about the world. Um, and how they interpret problems. And so we have some different strategies for perspective taking in the book uh, in cross-cultural situations. And there are about 60 to 70 stories like the one I just uh, told you uh, in, the, in Save Your Ammo. And they're all used to illustrate various thinking and learning strategies that we found. Your um, call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Seven. Um, I hope everybody can still hear me. Um, let's see. So there's uh, many stories in the book and the accounts that we have, uh, they range from 
uh, young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marine uh, conducting training exercises all the way up to senior level executive engagements. Um, and um, so that's where all the range of where the examples in the book are coming from. Um, a common challenge, that, a work-related challenge that we've heard a lot um, across uh, that kind of transcends engagements at various levels um, is kind of, it's rooted in the notion that wherever uh, people work, there's a tension that occurs because of pride. So we as Americans tend to be proud of our people, our capabilities, our equipment and our technologies, and other nations are proud as well. And so that can lead often to either implicit or overt conflict. And so to kind of to push, put the issue on, on a pin is what do, you, what do you say and how do you act when you think you have better stuff, um, to put it bluntly. Um, and we have a whole chapter that's dedicated to planning communication. And this is one of the challenges we touch on. I don't have time to cover uh, that full um, case. But I invite you to have a look at um, how Navy Captain Pete Miller tackled this issue that I just mentioned when he was working with the Australian submarine force because he has a, he had a lot of uh, success with his approach. And uh, Pete, if you happen to listen to this, aloha. Um, the reactions that we've heard from readers so far have uh, been really uh, interesting and encouraging. We've had a lot of great feedback from military reviewers, uh, General Zinni former CENTCOM uh, commander has said it's a must read for anyone um, in the military going overseas. And we've also had some really great reactions from the academic community as well. Uh, scholars like Ken Kushner, Michelle Gelfand, and, and a few others. So that's been really great. People who have been reading it have been telling us, uh, some of the, the folks that we're targeting who are going into new careers have commented that it's really giving them some different templates uh, for how to think about situations and how to react in situations that they're likely to see, uh, which is really great. Um, folks who have been in careers uh, like this for a long time and are used to these uh, engagements have come in and kind of like Doug, that it's been really neat to see some of these uh, skills and strategies that they've developed over the years kind of put into one place. And uh, Lastly, some folks that we've talked to who transitioned out of the military, and this is really interesting for us. We had never thought of this uh, kind of as a, as a perspective, but that seeing these strategies in one place has kind of given them a different lens for thinking about their experiences and how to communicate the value that they now bring uh, to the civilian work context now that they've transitioned out. So save your ammo, uh, all in all, I'll finish up here. It's uh, the juice that we've squeezed out of hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews, um, all wrapped in engaging scenarios. We hope you enjoy it. As Doug mentioned, um, uh, I think, or maybe it was John, you can find it on uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and iBooks. And we've had some requests uh, for bulk, bulk orders as well, which has been uh, very nice to hear. And um, we have set it up with Barnes and Noble and BookPal. Um, they can handle those orders with discounts. So if you do happen to get a copy and you feel inspired, please uh, leave us a comment on Amazon. Uh, it, that really helps us get the word out. All right, that was all I had. That was my quick overview um, of more than a decade of research, really. So I'll take some of your questions. I'll start out and again, you know, reading through the book, um, I, I could relive a lot of situations that I have been in personally, as probably most of the listeners have. I'm curious um, on your thoughts for the people that were not successful, people that were not ready to be in a situation and totally mess it up. Do you think there are certain people um, in civil affairs, there's an assessment process before you are and you know to go in civil affairs as as well as being a FAO or certain things. Do you think that there are people that just cannot learn this and should be taken away from this kind of engagement? Ah, uh, um, I think that there is a lot more potential to learn these skills um, than than people often think. Uh, I do often run into kind of the uh, 
the idea that you're you're born with this either you're born with it or um or or all is lost and i think there there's much greater capability potential to develop these skills than um than i think we we give people credit for a lot of the time are there folks who can who can never uh who can never learn this maybe perhaps um but coming at it from the kind of the lens and the perspective that i've come at it from is i don't uh, I've never found it a useful uh, kind of uh, stance to take, at least coming at it from a training and education um, um, frame um, to, to think of it as something that, that can't be developed. Um, and I, just seeing a lot of, uh, of, of folks uh, going into these situations, I think we have to keep in mind that it, it's often really, really stressful situations that we're putting people into. And uh, just because people don't necessarily display these skills or engage in this thinking right off, um, it doesn't mean that um, if they're prompted uh, that they can't. And we've seen that a lot of the time. Perspective taking is a great example of that. Is uh, we've seen people that that simply forget to think about what other people want um, going into situations. But as soon as they're somebody prompts them, says, "Hey, what do you think they might want?" they're perfectly able to kind of think outside of their own framework um, in those situations. So, sorry, that was a very long um, response that I, I hope I addressed it um, for you. Yeah, so I'm, one more question, then I'll turn over to John to pull, pull some questions out of the chat. Um, you, you mentioned in the book, and probably most people in this, uh, listening have been in these briefings, You so you get that cultural, um, one hour slide presentation before you deploy and that's supposed to you know make a whole brigade worth of people understand what they're getting into and then when you get there it's nothing like what you heard what do you think could be done to improve for the not the individuals that specialize in this whether civil affairs fails as of whatever it is but for the masses um you know the soldiers on the ground the sergeants e3 that will likely engage with um, a foreign counterpart, what could be done to improve that um, information so that it's when they get into a situation, it's actually useful and they think, they're not thinking back to, oh no, I can't show the bottom of my shoe, which is one of the things you mentioned in your book. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's two things. There's kind of uh, coming at it from, um, kind of a, a higher higher level of managing uh, programs perhaps is, I think there's been a lot of um, attention in the past. We tend to be very reactionary um, where the cultural training that you just described, the one hour PowerPoints um, often come out of a reaction to something negative that happened. Um, and so it's a preventative kind of approach where we're trying to make sure people don't do things that where they mess up. And I think we kind of need to politically flip that on its head and say, well, let's take a positive approach and let's try to invest in building these skills um, that en enable people to figure out uh, some more productive ways of, of, of handling these situations. And building skills takes time. And that's, that's often the, uh, the challenge. And it takes, um, it takes investment and resources. And, um, I think one of the hopes that we have with the book is to kind of provide that flip side of here's what it looks like uh, when people do things successfully. And here's the real value, the real outcomes in solving problems um, and uh, getting out of situations safely. Um, showing the positive, uh, we're hoping can create some motivation uh, to kind of invest in, in building these skills. And in terms of how we build them, I think um, injecting culture where it belongs, which is in the thinking that most people already have to do uh, when they're working overseas. So into the activities that are, that are part of preparing yourself rather than, um, so part of the planning, part of the uh, teaching partner forces uh, training, um, it needs to be embedded in that and not a separate um, kind of stovepiped uh, 
PowerPoint if you boil it down to, to that. So that was that was my thoughts on that issue, Doug. That was a great question. John, thank you. Um, do you want to go some questions on the chat? Yes. So uh, a few comments and a question uh, with the time we have remaining here. Um, there's a gentleman at Major Sabazeba who works in a NATO environment, and he said that uh, it's everyday adaptation and cross-cultural interaction. Uh, great point. I mean, here in Europe, uh, given your background as well, Dr. Rasmussen, you know that uh, it's much easier because it's like the United States going from one state to another state is a whole other country in a very different culture. Um, it, in the United States, we often have to stretch ourselves to get it outside of our climate, uh, outside of our comfort zone to speak with someone who has a very different culture from ours, especially if you're um, in the military, you're working in a, a nonprofit area as well. Another person wrote, uh, knowing your audience is very important. While holding a shura with village elders in Afghanistan, a British documentarian asked to show the elders photos from 9-11. They not only had no clue what the photos were, but did not believe it was from people hiding in Afghanistan. Uh, the person said, look, we live in dirt. How could we do all that? They believe that it was Russia bombing Kabul during the Soviet-Afghan war. Uh, and there's some footage of this interaction that's on YouTube. Um, a question that came in from uh, retired Colonel Dennis Cahill. He's asking that uh, about perspective taking, and it's a great topic, and wondering if you could share a few more examples from the 12 core competencies related to perspective taking. Um, so perspective taking is one of the competencies. So. Um, the other competencies, uh, we've divided them into four clusters, really. So the first one cluster of competencies has to do with uh, maintaining a diplomatic mindset. So there we have three competencies that are really all about um, understanding the value of relationships and building uh, good rapport with people in other cultures. For, uh, for some folks working overseas, that they know that intuitively, um, but we think that that if you, for, in terms of setting uh, requirements for training and education programs, that really needs to be explicit in the training is what, what is the value of culture, cultural information, uh, and in building skills and in establishing relationships, and then what can those relationships do uh, for me in a work context? Like how can that help me accomplish my mission? That needs to be out front um, the pragmatic value of, of culture and relationships. Um, and so that cluster also has to has competencies associated with kind of managing your reactions and your emotions to things. It's not about always being positive and liking everyone and everything uh, that you see in other cultures, but having some effective strategies for kind of um, managing how you deal with that internally. Um, there's competencies associated with um, so, like I mentioned, self-directed learning, being able to uh, have strategies for going out and finding information yourself, talking to people, what do you talk to them about, learning uh, about uh, culture from other people who are part of the culture, uh, and um, vetting your resources, um, and being learning from reflection and getting feedback. Um, there's the cultural reasoning strategy, or competencies, which perspective taking is part of that. Uh, sense making or coping with surprises is another competency uh, where there, it's beneficial to have some reasoning strategies to help you make sense of when uh, strange, unexpected things happen uh, because it can be easy to write them off sometimes. Um, the last set of competencies have to do with uh, being able to act with uh, a very baseline amount of information that many people start out with when they go into working in new areas. So they might have some tidbits and facts some regional information. How do you take that minimal, very minimal baseline of information and do something with it? How do you use that to create relationships? How do you seed that information to help you learn more? Um, and then finally, communi planning communication, uh, thinking about what what you want to get across to people and kind of having some strategies for using cultural information to um, to adapt your communication and your self presentation strategies. So understanding how other people look at you, how they interpret you because of what you look like, you might look different uh, than the people that you're working with. 
how do they interpret that and how do you take that into account when you plan your communication? Thank you. So, uh, oh, yeah, just a couple comments and one final question for you to close this out. Um, Mr. John DeGeest wrote, working with local populations in Kosovo and being able to communicate in another language not only helped me with building rapport with those individuals, but also created a different dynamic with the interpreters assigned to us. Um, he also says that we as Americans tend to project our understandings and values onto others without thinking about it. We really need to have uh, an awareness of this to overcome it. A uh, question that came in, uh, the pre-deployment training regarding cross-cultural awareness is an utmost important skill, especially in civil military interaction. So the question um, for you, ma'am, is what is the recommended time duration for building such a competency or at least to get the basic skills? Um, that's a great question. I mean, so the folks that we spoke to largely developed a lot of these skills over a lifetime. Um, and um, we think it's definitely more than a one hour PowerPoint presentation, but it also has to do with uh, not just time, but the kinds of uh, experiences that you put people through. Uh, so giving them practice, thinking through problems, uh, we think is necessary and that can be done um, in perhaps a few hours or half a day, depending on uh, how well it's done and um, kind of what the, uh, the learning objectives that you want to reach are. Um, we're hoping, uh, so there's a uh, one of the hopes that we have for the book is there's a theory of expertise that kind of looks at it as uh, people who are experts are ones that have a lot of templates in their heads for how to handle situations. And that's something we develop through uh, experience. We're hoping that putting other people's experiences in this book um, can kind of provide a, a starting point of templates for people of situations that they can draw from so that when they get into situations uh, they can say, oh, I've seen something like this before, um, and I know I have options for handling the situation. And I think you need to go about um, any classroom training or exercises that you think about. You need to think about that in the same way as we're providing people with practice, thinking through problems, and we're giving them templates that they can use for, um, for the rest of their careers. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, one final comment that we got in there. Uh, people wrote about the value of translators and wealth of information that they could provide about the local areas to really lean on their backgrounds and have a good rapport with any translator if you don't understand the language or have not invested as much time into understanding the culture. Um, another person wrote, uh, Mr. Dennis Cahill, I often say that everything I know about civ uh, CA civil affairs I learned from Somalia, uh, his time in Operation Restore Hope in 1992-93. We had no time to prepare to operate in a place no one else had heard of before. And he found that people are people wherever you go. So being yourself and showing a human side is very helpful. Uh, for closing comments, I want to turn this over to uh, Doug Hurst. Uh, th thanks again uh, so much for this. One thing that stood out in your book that I really appreciated is you didn't shy away from the really odd things that we may encounter in, with other cultures. Um, there's a couple of things, you know, in Afghanistan and Thailand that you brought out that everybody knows happens and everybody talks about, but don't really ever see it in a in a uh, culture, uh, you know, briefing before we deploy. So I appreciated that you took every opportunity and every ex, uh, experience that somebody may have. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, I, I found the book to be uh, very, like I said, kind of walking down memory lane. It was very, very helpful. I wish I would have had it about 20 years ago. Um, I think it would help me a little bit more as I started my path, but um, hopefully we can get this in the hands of the, the next generation that's gonna carry this on. And with that, I'll turn it over to you for any last comments that you have before we close out. Well, thank you so much, uh, Doug and John and everybody for, for coming here today. I really appreciate this opportunity to share uh, the fruits of our decades of, of labors and joys uh, working in this area. Um, I hope you enjoy the book. I hope it's, uh, it's helpful to you. I hope if you, if you enjoy it, if you wanna chat about it, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I'm happy to talk about this um, always and um, Please also, if you want to share uh, your thoughts 
about the book with me and if you see any other um, ways that we can we can we can use this to help teach the next generation please um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk so thank you again everybody for your time thank you thank you dr uh, louise rasmussen of global cognition and author of savior ammo thanks for your time and uh thanks for being on this webinar thank you all thanks take care you too